Good afternoon and welcome to the final presentation of the Global EV Charging Webinar event on EV Charging Best Practices and Power Quality. And during the event, we've already seen a lot of interesting presentations uh, on this best practices in general and on the power quality related to EV charging. And all these webinars have been recorded, uh, including this one and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later. So if you missed any of the presentations or if you want to re-watch a presentation, um, you can find those on the ALATNL YouTube channel. Um, please subscribe over there to receive any notifications. Um, I will be hosting this uh, final webinar. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can ask these in the question box in the GoToWebinar tool itself. Um, I will be monitoring the question logs and will select uh, interesting questions to be answered after the presentation. Um, and this event has been made possible with support from the Progresses project. Um, this project is supported by the Horizon 2020 program from the European Union. And it's something that's focusing on improving efficiency and grid integration of next generation energy supply infrastructure. And now I have the pleasure to introduce you to our next and final presenter, our own Tim Slangen from Eindhoven University of Technology, who is a PhD candidate with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Energy Systems of the same university and at ALAT NL. Um, his research is focused on measuring and modeling the emission of and effects of superharmonics from electric vehicle chargers in the distribution grids. And he will now be presenting about measuring and modeling the superharmonic emissions from EV fast chargers. The floor is yours, Tim. Yes, thank you, Thijs. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, very good. Uh, wait a second. So yes, thank you, Thijs, for the introduction. Um, I will be presenting this webinar about measuring and modeling superharmonic emission from uh, EV fast chargers. Um, so better? Okay, good. Um, so first, a little overview. I will start very briefly with some background on uh, superharmonics. We already saw something about this in the last few sessions of today and uh, yesterday. And then I will briefly go to uh, a measurement campaign I did in the last year. Uh, at several locations throughout the Netherlands at EV fast chargers. I will discuss the methods used and also uh, discuss with you the analysis of those uh, results. Um, also, because there's no normative method yet to do these measurements and to do the analysis, I will dive a bit further into the practices I learned uh, by doing the measurements and by doing these analysis uh, to, uh, to share this with you. Uh, then I will show, of course, some interesting results. And uh, to conclude with some recommendations for further research and some recommendations for doing field measurements on the superharmonic distortions. So, yeah, I think most of you have seen this slide before. Uh, very briefly, what are superharmonics? Uh, conducted waveform distortion between 2 and 150 kilohertz. Uh, quite arbitrary because not really uh, describing the behavior of the emission itself, but has to do with the standardization framework. That used to be there uh, for power quality up to two kilohertz and electromagnetic compatibility starting at 150 kilohertz uh, also beyond that frequency mainly a radiated emission instead of conducted um, so in between the standardization remained quite limited there is something going on now there are some normative standards uh, or not normative informative standards uh, at the moment and also research is uh, increasing which is obvious when you look at the number of papers for the last few years on this topic, that's also increasing quite rapidly. Uh, some effects, we just saw the presentation of uh, Yale about the RCDs. That's a very interesting effect of, that superharmonics can have. Uh, also some audible interferences like induction cooking plates that can start making noises. Um, like harmonics, capacitors can be affected by superharmonics because their impedance will be inversely proportional with the frequency. So will be extra heating, higher currents for those uh, frequencies. Um, this morning, we saw that the smart meters can be affected by a superharmonic as well, uh, with errors up to, I think it was 2000% even, so quite large uh, numbers. That's really something uh, you do not want. And EV charging uh, is possibly affected by a superharmonics as well. Um, now, this slide I also took from my presentation from last year, but then the focus was on the first topic, the EV onboard charges. 
Uh, so these are quite limited in power. Uh, may, yeah, they're inside the vehicle, uh, convert AC from the grid into DC inside the vehicle, powers mostly 11 or 22 kilowatt, either one or three phase uh, used to charge the vehicles either during night or during working day from empty to full. Um, but the last year, my research was more focused on the higher power uh, DC charges, uh, also as used uh, for electric vehicle charging, but also for buses and trucks uh, in both depot and uh, for opportunity charges. And as you can see, the charge times decrease and the powers will increase. Uh, so in the end, uh, we are talking about powers uh, between 50 and 150 kilowatts for depot charges and even up to uh, 600 kilowatts for uh, the opportunity charges. So for very short time, high power uh, charging of buses and trucks. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, the measurement campaign, uh, the main research interest here were the harmonic and superharmonic distortions. Uh, we looked at both the effect of a single charger active uh, and multiple charges active uh, of interest was if there are some interactions between charges active at the same time, if there will be some summation in harmonic distortions or superharmonic distortions. Um, of course, what happens to the voltage? It's very important for the grid operator to see how the voltage at transformer looks like and also to look for any resonances in the practice. Um, the effect of the charging power that uh, means two things. In the first, the type of charge that is used can be limited power, but also charges are not always used at that maximum power. Uh, a high, large amount of charges is at the moment up to 350 kilowatts. The vehicles able to do these amount of powers is quite limited. So mostly charges won't be working at the maximum power uh, in practice at the moment. So this is also something uh, to take into account. And all this research is part of uh, the TEPCAF project, uh, which is a three-year project uh, where we, in the end, would like to have some more insights in uh, yeah, how these charges work in practice, what can be the expected distortions for the grid operators, and to have a model describing uh, harmonic and superharmonic emission from uh, these kind of devices. So last year, uh, I did a measurement campaign throughout the Netherlands at the six locations, um, you can see that they are mainly located uh, at quite intensive use highways, the A2 from Amsterdam to Maastricht. The south of the Netherlands is a quite busy one. And also the A12 from Rotterdam to Utrecht uh, are very intensively used highways. So we choose these locations to uh, make sure that we would be able to see uh, the effect of an intensively used location uh, in practice. Also, during the COVID situation, because a lot of people won't be traveling to their office last year, but still to have some uh, charging actions during the day, we selected this, these locations uh, accordingly. So mostly highway charging uh, with multiple DC charges. Uh, most locations have four, six, or even eight of them. Uh, different types, so about 50 kilowatts, 150 kilowatts, and even 350 kilowatts at one location. That's what we, uh, what we saw. Um, and for each location, we measured for a whole week uh, to see what happens during a day, during peak hours, during night, but also to see difference between the working days and weekends to see those uh, variations. The measurement method, this is something as which was also discussed this morning. That there is no normative method yet describing how you should measure superharmonic disturbances, um, and especially not for field measurements, because the standards that are there are mainly used for lab measurements. So they describe a LISN a, a line, line impedance stabilization network or artificial mains network uh, to be used in the lab, but you do not have this in practice in field measurements. You have to do, you have to deal with the situation you find there and do measurements at that point. Um, and also the power quality analyzers that are on the market do not have the things we want them to have to because some are advertised as being able to measure superharmonics, but they only do this for the voltage. Whilst if you want to do research and really tell something about what's going on and what's the effect of some uh, installation, you also would like to see the current for the high frequencies as well. So for this reason, we uh, acquired two scopes from Yokohama which are mobile uh, is mobile equipment uh, 
each has eight channels, a high resolution of 16 bits, uh, and sample rate at one mega sample per second. Uh, and we use uh, voltage probes and Rogowski's with a high bandwidth as well to do measurements on voltage and current uh, at this high frequency to be able to see the effect of uh, both of them. Um, we have two units, which allows us to do measurements at two different locations at the same time. So this can be one close to a charge and the other one at the transformer station or another location at the end of the feeder. Um, and there's possibility for time synchronization between the units uh, by GPS, so that the results will always be comparable afterwards, uh, so that you know when a certain snapshot was taken. And here is an important setting because you need to make a choice uh, on which interval you're going to do the measurements. You can't do a continuous measurement during a week because you will collect such high amounts of data that's unable to handle it. Um, so you, we make snapshots of one second for every minute, and then we already collect 100 gigabytes per week. So that's quite a lot of data. Um, and before we started the measurement, uh, we made sure that we did one short continuous measurement of, well, let's say, one hour. And we started some charging ex action, stop them to also capture the startup uh, behavior of the charges. Um, but if you want to do measurement for a long time with a high resolution in voltage and current, uh, you have to make a trade-off between your snapshot and your measurement interval. Now, this is an overview of how a typical situation uh, in the field looks like. Uh, so this applies to most locations where we measured. Uh, you have a medium to low voltage transformer, um, a cable going to a main uh, distribution cabinet or the low voltage cabinet of the transformer itself. Uh, and from there, there are outgoing feeders to the separate charges. So mainly uh, you have one or two charges connected at one feeder um, and no or very limited other loads in the same installation. So maybe just some lightning or some other equipment uh, connected. So Whilst this is a field measurement, it's still a very, uh, yeah, the situation, you can have a very good overview of it because it's just the charges in this installation. And in that way, you can still do measurements and tell something about the interaction uh, between them. Um, and here we measured at separate locations the voltage at transformer terminals, the low voltage uh, site, and the current going uh, to the charges and the currents uh, coming from the transformer into the cabinet to have an overview of uh, emission from charger one going into charger two, three, and four, also back into the grid and to see any summation or interaction occurring. Now, the next few slides, I will show this picture that's actually in the frequency spectrum for one of the measurements um, and tell something about the analysis how are you going to tell something about what you are seeing over here? So we have here a uh, frequency analysis, a spectrum overview uh, of a measurement we did at a fast charging location. So you see that there is some emission between 16 and 18 kilohertz and something between 36, around 36 kilohertz. Um, and what you see is that this is often not just one component, like with harmonics, it's often a a band or a bin of components, uh, and the width is not really determined. It can be very wide. It can even be broadband changing over time, or constant over time. Um, you do not know beforehand, um, but this is how one snapshot uh, can look like. And then the question is, if you do a measurement over a whole week and for different scenarios, how are you going to compare this emission you see over here for those different uh, scenarios. So how are you going to trace the frequencies of interest or the bins uh, with the components in them? So one way to do this um, is by using bins with a uh, fixed size. So in this example, I choose a quite wide uh, bin of 5 kilohertz. And in the interval we have between 10 and 50 kilohertz, it gives you eight bins. So the resolution is quite limited. You are generalizing over 5 kilohertz. Uh, but in this example, you see that our components fall nicely within the bins. So it's quite good to compare. But well, if you want more resolution in the frequency domain, you have to decrease the bin size. And as is proposed by the IEC standard, 
uh, is to use two kilohertz bins or even smaller ones, 200 hertz bins. And what happens then is that the components won't be in one bin anymore. They will be separated in two bins. It can be at the boundary of two bins. So in, in this way, it's of course good for standardization on emission limits uh, to make bins out of the spectrum instead of having to look at individual components. But to trace the components or to see how they behave over time, it's quite difficult in this way. So an alternative would be uh, to have not fixed bins at the fixed frequencies uh, starting from zero going to 150, but by making this more uh, flexible. So for instance, select the center frequency of interest uh, and put a bin of two kilos around this one. Another option would be to make also the width of the bin flexible. So on the left part, the red one, it's a quite broad spectrum. Um, it's four kilohertz uh, in width. And on the right part is quite small. But then the question is, how are you going to determine the width? Are you going to set a certain threshold? In this case, the delta uh, from which the program knows that the bin is starting and ending again. That's all quite difficult. Yeah, another example, um, which I think will not be suitable in practice is the peak detector. Um, you have some problems over here because the peaks won't be constant in frequency. They will maybe shift. Also, the height uh, can be changing over time. And so it's quite difficult by just looking at the peak values and writing an algorithm for this uh, to see how the emission uh, varies over time. Another point I would like to bring on the attention is that the standardization framework is at the moment uh, describing or talking about uh, making a TSHC, total superharmonic current value uh, for superharmonic currents, like is used for harmonics, uh, but then for superharmonics to have an indication of amount of superharmonic distortion you have in an installation. Um, but unlike with harmonics, um, and too with harmonics as well, if you look at the THD value, what is this value really telling you? Because the triplet harmonics we know are much more worse for a system. They can bring much more damage than, for example, the, the other old harmonics. And the even harmonics have other effects as well. So by just looking at the THD, you do not really know what's going on in the installation. And by comparing TSHC values or TSHD, total superharmonic distortion, you are generalizing in such a way that you can't really tell uh, what's going on in the location. So there is a an, an, uh, work proposed by the University of Lulio to have sort of weighted total supermonic current value depending on which frequencies have higher impact uh, in practice. So for instance, the top right, the top left figure, sorry, um, shows one of these uh, examples. So we know that some supermonic components are hearable up to 20 kilohertz. Ideally, you can hear these components but not in the same way. So frequencies between one and four kilohertz, uh, the human ear is much more sensitive to them. So even if amplitude is very low, we can still hear them. And if the amplitude will be much higher, the frequency will be higher. So increasing uh, to nine kilohertz, we will uh, need to be a higher sound pressure before we actually hear those components. So you can say that components between one and four kilohertz are much more annoying at the same amplitude than the higher frequencies. And in this way, you can come up with some weighting factor. Um, so for example, the noise severity indicator, which is a weighted factor, taking those kind of things into account. And the same, um, you can use plenty of examples to, to describe this. Um, so the bottom figure, for example, shows the, the risk of cable terminations failing is increasing for higher frequencies. So you can arg argue that for higher frequencies, the weighting of those components should be higher. You should put a higher weight on them. And then the total supermonic current uh, won't be just linear over all frequencies. So like in this example, uh, you can have all separate uh, frequency bins weighted in a different way to have an order assessment of what's going on uh, in terms of superharmonic distortion. But then the question arises, 
is this fair in all use cases? Because if I have a charger at an industrial plant somewhere far away from uh, people living uh, and it's making some noise, who cares? Is it really troublesome? But if I have the same charger in a residential area with a lot of people living there, you really do not want that noise. So this too can be use case dependent. And uh, in the one case, a certain component will be very bad for the situation. And in the other case, it won't. So this is something to think about as well, that before generalizing to values like the TSHC value, uh, you should think about what is actually causing problems in practice and what is uh, giving you uh, problems. So those are some thoughts uh, on the current standardization framework. Uh, on how to measure and how to analyze uh, superharmonic components. Um, another question uh, that arises is how do you deal with time varying components? Because like we saw before, uh, there can be some interaction between components. Uh, they might be not constant over time. So for example, uh, changing uh, with the fundamental frequency or changing outside this interval. So how are you dealing with this? Are you going to model the maximum value? Are you going to use some statistical analysis to uh, describe the signal? Um, this too is something uh, that's not described yet in standardization framework, but that should be taken into account. Because we also saw that within a cycle, there can be changes in impedance of the device that cause the superharmonic emission to change as well within a cycle. And on a longer period of time, we saw at some uh, field locations a so-called frequency beating effect that the superharmonic components uh, change with a, a period of around 10 or 20 seconds. So it will go up to a certain value and 20 seconds later, it will go down again. So how will this influence your system? That's an important question. So this was quite some about analysis and standardization. Um, I will discuss some results uh, from the field measurements, uh, mainly focusing on emission, supermodic emission, uh, also relation between voltage and current, which is uh, gives, can give quite in interesting information, um, and some impedance estimates of the grid for higher frequencies that can be made. So this uh, figure shows for one location where we did measurements, uh, the RMS currents during a whole week uh, of the four different charges. Uh, and for some reason, charger four was less popular. It was not used as much as the other charges, uh, but that's something to, uh, to, to remember for later. Um, if we are about to look at the spectrum of the charges, so this is one snapshot at one single time point taken, you see some uh, third, fifth, and seventh harmonic present, as is typical for the kind of charges we were investigating. Um, and some emission between three and four kilohertz and seven and eight. I think uh, some of you maybe saw this results before uh, this morning in the presentation from uh, Inexis. Um, but I do not want to focus on just a single snapshot because this is just one second within a week of measurements. So what can you derive from this information? Something interesting to think about is how will this component, uh, this three, 0.3 kilohertz in this case, change with the fundamental current of the charger. So you see on the left figure, um, on the x-axis, the fundamental current of the charger and here the current of the 3.3 kilohertz uh, component, that there were not that many uh, sessions with actually the full power of the charger. There were many in between them. Uh, but there is, yeah, it's <laughs> difficult to see some relation between the fundamental current and the superharmonic current. But the correlation is quite not that large, 0 0.8. But if you're about to look at um, the complete band, so 2 to 4 kilohertz, you will see a much stronger correlation uh, between the fundamental current and the superharmonic components within that bin. So this means that an increase in fundamental current also leads to an increase in the superharmonic currents in that uh, frequency bin. And this uh, gives, because we use the flexible bin, which, which is in practical case, two to four kilohertz, gives more insight uh, in the supermonic behavior than by looking at just one component. And what 
what's also interesting to do is look at the correlation between uh, the current at a certain frequency and the result you see in the voltage or the effect on the voltage. And again here, yeah, we're looking at just the 3.3 kilohertz component. Yeah, it, it looks noisy. There's some the secondary emission over here. Uh, but when you look at the whole bin, so two to four kilohertz, you see a quite clear, uh, you can make a quite good dis distinction between primary and secondary emission in this case, and just the secondary emission. So this means that at points, the current from the charger was almost zero, that there still was some effect on the voltage. So those points you see over here are the result of secondary emission from the other charges being active at the point the first charger was not active. And if I then look at the current of the complete installation, so not one charge, but the whole installation going to the transformer, um, you see a quite nice linear line. So also very high correlation, 0 0.98, that's very high. Um, this means that if the installation current at this frequency is increasing, that the voltage will too. And that makes sense because this current will be drawn uh, uh, over the grid impedance. And in this way, uh, because correlation is so linear, you can also make an estimate of the grid impedance at that frequency. Because what we are in fact, what the insulation is in fact doing is injecting the 3.3 kilohertz into the grid with these kinds of values. Um, so in this example, if there's three amps injected, there is a one volt uh, effect on the voltage. So the impedance could be estimated. So in this way, by looking at both voltage and current, not just the voltage, um, this can give you very valuable information about the impedance of the insulation and ultimately of the grid, which will help you with modeling uh, the situation you have over there. So the same, um, if we look at the seventh harmonic, that uh, was also quite large, uh, we saw in the figure before. You again see the distinction between primary and secondary emission and secondary emission. But more interesting, if we look at the seventh harmonic of the whole installation, you can really see the effect of the four different charges active on the voltage current relationship of the installation. So here, this is secondary emission um, from the grid or external components because the charger were not drawing any currents at that point. Here, you see the result of one charger active, the second one, the third one, uh, and the fourth one, and you see there are less points over here. And that's what we saw before. The fourth charger is less used, which, which leads to the conclusion that there were less uh, points at which four charges were active. So this is what you can conclude from this. Um, and these kind of relations can give you, again, very uh, yeah, insightful information uh, about the grid situation and help you with modeling and understanding what's going on in the installation. Will it be absorption? Will it be summation? Things like that can be concluded uh, from this. So I think already some interesting results and more will follow uh, of course i will uh, publish these results later this year in a paper um, and also uh, i will of course share the results with uh, anyone who's interested um, but to end with some recommendations uh, mainly for doing field measurements so the first one yeah there is no standard yet but determine the field measurement settings carefully so if you're going to measure at the interval base always first do a measurement continuously to see what's going on, what's there at the location before making the choice of doing interval measurements. And also for the measurement equipment that is there already, uh, often is making averages over 15 minutes or averages over whole bins, but you do not really know uh, what's going on in a smaller interval, what's going on uh, within a cycle, what's going on within the 15 minutes. You also would like to see this. So that's something to take into account. Now, this one, I think I discussed it a few times already. Always measure both voltage and current. Voltage might be interesting for the grid operator, just interested in seeing what's going on. But for research, you do need voltage and current both at sufficiently high sample rates. 
because otherwise you can't say anything about uh, summation, interaction, uh, in the end, who is responsible? There are no standards yet, but in the end, you would like to know who is responsible for the emission in some uh, some range. So you need voltage and current measurements. Now this one we discussed. Um, so first look at the spectrum before calculating uh, the TSHC or applying bands. Um, consider using a flexible width band for your supermonic quantification because might be difficult to find in practice a spectrum that fits perfectly into the IEC uh, bands. Uh, the weighting, something we discussed. So maybe use case dependent uh, assessment of when something is troublesome and when it's not. Take into account variations within your measurement interval before taking the average and also outside of it. Um, and the last one, yeah, collect as much data as manageable you see a lot of equipment uh, working on reducing computational power and uh, using less storage size. But if you want to know what's going on at a location, or if you really want insight and want to do analysis, you want to collect as much data as manageable and it's a bit open to decide what is still manageable. Of course, depends on computational power, things like this. Um, yeah, my last slide. Uh, some further research recommendations. Um, so, yeah, from the measurements, we saw some estimates of the high frequency grid and device impedance. Um, but of course, if you want to model uh, the effect of an installation on the voltage, or if you want to model the effect of an extra device, you do, do need insight in those impedances as well. Um, also, the effect on equipment needs to be studied further, uh, like we saw with the RCDs. That's really something uh, to be uh, to look into. Um, also, the question: How do you model time varying superharmonics, both within a cycle, so subcycle changes, um, and longer time, so that the frequency beating intermodulation effects that cause slower uh, in second base variations? How are you going to model them and take them into account in your uh, uh, planning and analysis? And finally. Yeah, I think uh, this is also a good conclusion. There needs to be standardization on the measurements, not just for the lab, but also for the field, because this will give you a whole different situation. And also regarding the analysis, because before you can say something about uh, supermonic components, and ultimately before modeling them, there needs to be some standardization, some agreement on how to measure them and how to analyze them. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you are interested in my further research, you can find it uh, using the link below. It will lead you to the uh, university page with all my research and also papers uh, on it. Uh, also, feel free to send me an email uh, if you have any further questions. But uh, I think we have some time left to, uh, to answer one. So uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Tim, for this very interesting presentation. I must say, really nicely showed that there are still a lot of questions to get answered for standardization, like the way to build up the bins for the standardized uh, superharmonic measurements, the way to determine the, the impact in, uh, in real life in, uh, in different situations. Measurement results were also really interesting, really gave nice insight in uh, how these distortions, uh, well, what these distortions do in, uh, in practice. And uh, of course, you added with some very clear recommendations. Uh, um, it was really interesting to see. So um, let me start with a question I had myself. Um, the distortion from the DC charge is mostly a bit of the same frequency. So I was wondering if there were very different brands of DC chargers or mostly the same, or is it like a, a standard frequency that's used by uh, most different manufacturers? Or? Yeah, so what we... What we saw on the locations was that there were quite some different types present. Uh, so sometimes the older charges of the smaller size, uh, they use uh, other frequencies than the higher ones. Uh, so at the locations, we selected them so that we have a large variation in types of charges. So not just the power, but also the manufacturer. So in the results, I think the three to four kilos you saw quite some times, especially for the large ones, uh, but also uh, charges between 
at 10 and 20 kilohertz or even at much higher frequencies uh, are possible. So that's really something uh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, and I was wondering, because you gave some uh, recommendations for further research, which of those do you, or which one do you think like this is the most important one here we should uh, really focus on? Yeah, I think regarding standardization, we are on a good way. There's already quite a lot of things done, but I think it needs to be a bit more. There are still uh, informative standards. Um, I think before manufacturers are going to start making equipment that is able to measure uh, things like this, so that uh, yeah, people can get better insight in superhuman distortions in practice, there needs to be standardizations and agreements on the measurement and analysis of them. And then the equipment will follow, the manufacturers will make equipment, and then more people will start measuring, we will collect more data, get more insight on what happens. So I think the standardization on measurements and analysis is the most important one to, uh, to, to work on. And from there on, yeah, the rest will follow and research will be made more easier. Oh, excellent. Thank you for that answer. Um, good, good thing that there is, of course, the Empire project that's already working on this uh, standardization of measurements. So let's hope they uh, come up with uh, with these standards uh, quickly. Um, now uh, I've got a couple of questions from Sharmista. Um, first one: um, Will the obtained an an analysis results be comparable if you use two different bin widths for the same graph? That's the first one. So I think this question compares or means uh, if you use have one result and then use two bins to make the conclusion out of it, right? If I understand it correctly, things like that. So indeed, if you make the bin size smaller, uh, you will have more bins, of course. And in the end, uh, you will see that there are more bins with some components in them uh, because the value you find within the bin is a sort of RMS value. Um, so it will be a bit higher than the maximum component inside the bin. Um, so the result will certainly be different in terms of how the bins look like, because you obviously have more bins. Uh, but in the end, it shouldn't make a difference if you are going to calculate TSHC values, because this can be done either from the wire signal or from the bins uh, size. So that I think that will be a uh, difference. And another question from uh, Shamista. Um, when some chargers are at idle state, do they contribute to in the superharmonic emissions? Uh, and what percentage it is, is it approximately? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, because there's also, yeah, you can think about what is an idle state. Some devices will really disconnect from the grid in idle state. Uh, some devices still will have the filter connected in idle state. Um, and in the last case, if the filter will still be connected, uh, they are playing a role in absorbing supermonic emission from other charges. So because you have an impedance there, uh, often going to ground, and the other charger will start uh, being active, the inactive charger will still absorb these emissions. So that's one thing. Um, regarding the emission from the charge itself, when being idle, I did not see this in practice. So apart from secondary emission from the other devices, so uh, because other devices are charging, you will see the secondary emission, of course. Uh, but as far as I, I saw, there won't be any primary emission uh, at the point when the charger is at idle state. OK, and then we have a question from Jill Sut. Daria, we also uh, just presented about uh, RCDs and the influence of uh, our quality and harmonics on uh, on those ones. Um, let's see, uh, should the impedance in superharmonics range be calculated based on the THC values of voltage and current, or should it be calculated based on single frequency component, considering only the peak component in the range? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't think about this uh, before, um, but I would say the P component will give you the largest 
effect in the grid. So you inject the largest current, it will give you the largest voltage. Uh, so I would expect you then have more certainty in the value you calculate. Um, and when you just look at the bins, um, I think you're generalizing, so you won't find any resonances that might occur within that bin. So I would say look at P components, but do not generalize the two large bins if you want to estimate impedance. That's my first thought on this, but would be looking forward to having a discussion about this uh, in the future. Um, and now the final question, um, at least the final question I have now from the attendees, and that's um, also from Char. Mista, and she's asking if these secondary emissions, if they were coming from the from the grid, or that uh, they were caused or coming from another transformer. Yeah, so depends a bit on the location, um, but mostly the superharmonic emissions we saw were from the other charges in the same installation uh, being active, and we also measured them, so we could tell uh, this emission at charger one is caused by charger two because that one is active, we know that for sure. Um, but there also were some points where no charges were active and we still saw something, uh, but this we got different frequencies or just harmonics. And I would expect this to either be present in the grid voltage, so from the transformer or caused by some other installation uh, uh, nearby. But that's always difficult to tell. You can all, only say something about the things you're measuring, of course. And for the rest, it's one large black box. You see something, but do not know where it's coming from. So that's a, that's a good question. Well, oh, excellent. Well, we haven't received any new questions. It's also already almost quarter to four. So um, I think this will be the, uh, the end of this presentation and also the end of this uh, webinar event. Um, as told, if you've missed any of the other presentations or if you want to rewatch any of the presentations, uh, please go to our YouTube channel and um, well, you can uh, rewatch all the episodes over there. Um, uh, also, if you have any remaining questions or something you would like to, uh, to share with us or, um, well, even if you would like to be a presenter on our next event uh, next year, because we will be doing this the same event uh, next year too, and, uh, please contact us. Um, and I want to uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, I'll hopefully see you uh, see you next time. Bye bye.